Good morning, Dr. John. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join me today for this conversation. Great, great uh, being here. And uh, let's learn about sleep today. Absolutely. A lot of ground to cover. Um, as I generally tell my patients, you know, at minimum, a third of our life should be spent in bed asleep. Um, a third of our days and therefore a third of our lives. And so little things can we talk about that have more importance than this. So the first thing I want to do to introduce you to our audience is your background is so broad in pulmonary and critical care. What led you into sleep medicine and what inspired you to do all that you've done for the sleep community? Correct. Uh, sleep has always fascinated uh, me. It is a uh, simple but complicated. It's mysterious. It's spiritual. You know, as even as uh, early as in med school, uh, I used to have an all-nighter and try to take the exam. But I always found that if I slept the night well before, I was able to score higher. And sleep was uh, not much talked about. This is in the 80s. Uh, but then I realized that even in my daily life, if I rest well, I'm able to perform. I'm a better person. My mood's better. So I knew it was, uh, you know, it, it affects uh, several functions. And all through my career as an ICU doctor, I saw uh, terrible complications of blood pressure. When it is uncontrolled, you can have a stroke. And then, has, you know, disorders like uh, sleep apnea can affect high blood pressure and also uh, can affect diabetes, uh, can prevent, uh, you know, uh, further uh, worsening of your uh, you know, memory problems or dementia. So I knew this is a superpower we have. And as years went by, my passion grew and I just uh, said, I'm gonna dedicate my uh, life uh, to the research and to uh, spread the you know the knowledge about sleep. So I started my own clinic three years ago and then I finally decided to write a book and that's my passion and I'm trying to take it to the world to, uh, so everybody can uh, know the superpower they have within themselves. That's great. Well, and your experience has led you in the start of your career, I guess, to really see the end stage of sleep disorders and the complications that may lead many people to the ICUs. And now you get to focus much more on prevention and great health and making sure that we use our sleep, like you say, as a superpower to direct so much of our health. So I'm sure that's an inspiration because you can share stories of when this goes uncontrolled, this is what it can yield and now you get to work on the prevention. Yes, uh, as we grow older, you know, your life's philosophy changes. Then uh, I was practicing completely reactionary medicine in the mm -hmm. ICU, trying to save lives. But then I said, hey, let's go to the preventive side. And then sleep is one unifying thing, especially with the, like I just mentioned about, you know, the blood pressure, diabetes. Not only that, the huge impact it has on society with mental health. Uh, you know, when you sleep well, you know, your, your symptoms of anxiety and depression is better. So it affects all of us. Uh, you know, we're compromising on our, in our sleep because not many people know the impact good sleep can have. Just like you mentioned, it affects all facets of our body. And so here I am, I just want to spread the good news and to feel the joy that I feel by sleeping well and to share this knowledge uh, to everyone. That's great. Well, and, and what I want to do with our conversation is really dive in to some actionable steps that patients can take. And so just a really broad question for you to start with, of all the conversations you have, do you find yourself repeating the same two or three strategies or tactics for better sleep kind of across the population? Uh, do you find yourself saying the same things over and over again? And if so, please share those with us. Correct. Uh, so, you know, people uh, come and tell me, hey, you know, I can uh, sleep when I die uh, because people don't know the importance of sleep. You know, I tell people, hey, if you go on the path of uh, poor sleep habit and uh, not addressing your sleep disorders, then you can literally die in your sleep. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a common thing. So sleep is, uh, you know, uh, it, it's people take it. I'm not taking it very seriously because sleep problems does not hurt like a toothache. So we put it away and then it catches up, uh, you know, with us. So some of the strategy, in fact, I have an acronym for my sleep, uh, the seven proven sleep strategies that I've perfected over the last uh, 25 years. You know, I, I myself, I'm a, I was a poor sleeper in like in med school. And then during the grief of my um, mom when she passed away 10 years ago. And of course, as a small business owner, you know, all the decisions, uh, 
But I found a way, and that's why I've, uh, uh, I've given the seven proven sleep strategies. I can get into it as uh, now, or we can go step by step. What do you think, Greg? Um, I'll follow your lead. Let's oh. dive into All it. All right. Because I think it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of depth there. All right. So the acronym, uh, the you know, uh, viewers are listening. Uh, you can uh, uh, say it's called Sleep Now, S L E E P. N O W. So that's the acronym. And my daughter is in law school. She said that everybody needs an acronym. That's the only way you will uh, have uh, folks follow. I think I just put it down like that. So the first uh, in the acronym is the S is the schedule. So for any plan to succeed, we need to have a schedule. So we have to have, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the ideal schedule uh, to sleep will be between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. So that's when you have to focus the bulk of, uh, uh, of our sleep. So there's a caveat here. Uh, the common thing people uh, do is when they go to bed at 10 and they cannot fall asleep to 11.30, guess what most folks do? They actually go to bed at 9. Now you're struggling two and a half hours. So uh, please go to uh, uh, bed, uh, you know, close to the time you fell asleep. So if you're falling asleep, at 11 30 go to bed by 11 15 not earlier than that but the key here is you have to wake up at 6 a.m you have to be consistent and you know when people uh, do the schedule and they uh, see me after years of uh, suffering the first two weeks when they try to implement is the hardest they call me and they're angry at me and angry at themselves but after two weeks the cycle starts to improve so that's the s and next is the l in the acronym low light low noise low temperature remember melatonin the hormone that we have within our cell is only secreted in low temperature and in darkness. Mela means dark. So melatonin is only secreted in, in darkness. So make sure your bedroom is dark and also is secreted in lower temperature. Make sure your temperature is between 65 to 70. Of course, the uh, noise is not good for you for sleep. So prevent, uh, try to prevent us, uh, uh, you know, all the noisy environments around you. So next is my favorite uh, E in the acronym is the electronic. I tell people not to be on electronics at least an hour, but practically 30 minutes prior to going to sleep. The light from the phone, it's uh, pretty uh, damaging. Uh, you know, it uh, sends the signal to the brain saying it's still daytime. So remember, melatonin only secretes in darkness. Uh, the light uh, from the phone is uh, very detrimental to sleep. I keep my phone away. Uh, in fact, my New Year resolution was no phones for, uh, till, uh, from 7 p.m. All on so i've been uh, fairly consistent with that so uh, but practically i tell people at least 30 minutes i keep my uh, phone away from me because in the middle of the night you wake up you can look at the time and then wow it's only three o'clock uh, that's a major problem so i keep it in my uh, bathroom i have an alarm for uh, six or six thirty whenever i want to wake up and also the phone can have notification messages you're tempted and your mind starts to race so please remove your phone and keep it away that's uh that's the e and uh, next is uh, exercise in the acronym. Uh, so exercise uh, produces endorphins and also generates heat. So if you're exercising in the evening, make sure you exercise at least uh, four hours earlier. Uh, so the melatonin uh, actually secretes just prior to our body temperature dropping at night. So uh, ideal time to exercise is in the mornings, but if you have, uh, if you have to exercise in the evening, make sure you, uh, you exercise at least four hours prior. So then the last one in the acronym in the P is uh, power of your mind. Dr. John, I get asked all the time, how do I do it? So you have to power off your mind by giving your body a chance. You're resting your body by not exercising. You're, you don't have your phone. The lights are dim. So I also teach two techniques. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes here. The first technique is called vivid imagination. Uh, so the, I'm trying to uh, familiarize uh, everybody with this. So we, we bring reality to our bedroom, uh, but I want the abstract. So I tell you are the director of that show. I watched TV show last night. I started thinking about, I've been using this technique for about uh, 30 years in my own personal life. So I don't want reality in your bedroom. I just want to be uh, your abstract. Think about you are the creator. So, and your imagination, let it run wild, okay? And then the next one is yoga nidra. Uh, nidra is a Sanskrit for nothingness. You just lay down on your back. Uh, and you, and you spread your palms uh, towards the ceiling and you start thinking about nothing. In fact, if you want, you can start thinking in various parts of your body, thinking about your uh, 
head, uh, the tension in your muscles uh, and your arms and your legs, all the way down to your toes. So this is, uh, you know, this is part of the cognitive behavior therapy of uh, insomnia. So I incorporate that. So that's how you power off your mind. So next going down is N-O in the acronym, no to worries. Uh, so I, say, I get asked, Dr. John, we worry all the time. I say to people worry between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. and prepare to bed after that. So I, I tell people to have a dedicated uh, worrying time between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. Don't bring it to your bedroom, all right? So we are all prone to worries. I worry. I was getting ready to uh, the show last night. I was looking at all the key notes uh, uh, <laughs> Craig wanted me to do. So I, I finished all. I didn't look at it after that. So that's your time. And then the last one is W is win by losing. In the hustle culture, we want to hustle, hustle our way into everything. But sleep is uh, contrary to this hustle culture. Sleep is one a function. You have to gently get into it. You can't go get it. Uh, everybody says go get everything, but you cannot. You have to keep your uh uh, your routine very simple. That's why you have to lose yourself uh, in this process. So uh, we want sleep to be like an on and off switch, but sleep is a dimmer. You have to slowly dim it by a dim it down. So you have to start the process around 8 p.m. Uh, to get ready for 10 p.m. bed. So that's the sleep now acronym. So uh, and also I give the simple analogy. Uh, you uh, as you enter the bedroom, the when you enter the door, uh, it's like a TSA screener. You are bringing your worries to your bed beep, you got to go back, you can relax. And then if you're bringing your electronics uh, to you, to the bedroom, beep, it's you have to go back. And the same thing if, you have, if you're wearing like tight clothes, belt and metal on your bed, beep, you got to go wear comfortable clothes. So uh, these are the things you are preparing. It's like a big meal. You can't have the steak right away. You have to have the music, the, the cheese, the wine and the salad before. So it's a process. Unfortunately, uh, that's the only way. It's an ancient art. Uh, so I'm a huge fan of this holistic way of uh, getting our own natural. So I hope this helps, uh, Greg. Thanks. Absolutely. Yes. A lot of depth there. A lot of depth. And I appreciate you going through each one. Yeah. And uh, we'll definitely put those in the show notes so that they can be digested well, because how how you mention these really strikes me as, as I have, have discussions with my primary care patients, that it really involves a training process, that each of these pieces of the acronym um, aren't going to be quick, quick results. They're going to be schedules and they're going to be structure that you really have to build in that if you give that enough time in residence, then you reap the rewards. Um, you know, to, to generalize, you know, I think we do as a culture and we do as individuals, we, we look for something that, that can have a little more quick gratification. And it's nice to have you remind us that this is really where the value comes from. Um, so thank you for sharing those. And, and one that you mentioned that I really think would resonate with many of the people I work with is say no to worry. Um, I love how you phrased it as almost scheduling, schedule your worry, you know, cause we are going to have worries. It's natural, but putting, putting a boundary around it. And I love the TSA screener analogy where, you know, be, you know, you're outside your schedule. Mm -hmm. Just like if you and I had a, a meeting that starts here in an hour, we're, we're going to know that that's where we need to be. We're going to have dedicated time for it. Do the same with your worry. Do the same with your sleep schedule. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, it's a process. You can. Uh, so I tell people it will take about six weeks, but six weeks in the span of years of suffering with different things. Uh, it's not a big deal. You can get it two weeks. The first week is most difficult when you follow everything. Uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, I tell people to map out their sleep schedule. You know, I have enclosed it on my website, also in my book, uh, you know, the sleep journal. So you can see it's very eye opening to people when they fill that journal to see, hey, when did they have their caffeine? When did they take a nap? When did they take this medication? So it's an eye opener. So that also helps keep track. Uh, you know, uh, I prefer uh, a practical uh, handwritten, you know, sleep schedule and the sleep journal than the wearables mm -hmm. where everybody's uh, doing these days. Yes, that's a great point. And to dive into kind of specific situations that I run into a lot in primary care, um, and this is oversimplified, but you really run into the challenge of the sleep onset and the sleep maintenance. And obviously your tactics, I think, are truly applicable to both populations. But let's focus on the sleep maintenance individuals for a second. The individuals who they may have no trouble getting to sleep, but they wake up at 2 a.m. 
and can't get back to sleep. And let's really speak to those that maybe their mind seems to be what keeps them awake. Their mind races to the next day's activities or, or what they look back on for the day. What do you tell those individuals um, to try to reset their sleep patterns? Great question, Craig. So the sleep onset and sleep maintenance, when I see someone, I just have to ask them, is sleep, the lack thereof, is it a primary problem or is it coexistent? It's an underlying manifestation of a, of a medical disorder like heart problem, lung problem, diabetes problem. Is that, or mm -hmm. is it a psychological or a mental problem, anxiety and depression? So I go through my uh, my experience in all the other fields. I'm able to narrow it down. So then I'm able to say, hey, you just have a sleep problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, everybody goes through the acronym. And then if you wake up in the middle of the night, that is a significant problem. I Half of my clients have either one of the two. So here it gets really interesting. So... So if you look at the uh, sleep cycle, there are several stages and we are all prone to wake up at multiple times in the night. I also wake up uh, most of the time it is used to the restroom. So I tell people if you wake up, the simple thing is to do uh, keep the sleep shape. Don't come out of your shape or I sometimes call it the bubble. Uh, so but people come out of their shape by looking at their phone, right? Then they are at the clock. So there should not be any clock or electronics in your uh, vicinity or or your eyesight because once you look at the time craig it's over you are like wow it's three o'clock oh it's only three o'clock i only slept three hours four hours so we don't want that access so this helps at least 50 percent of that problem mm -hmm. right because once you are aware you know you're done so i tell people to keep that sleep shape and let's just come back to bed and try to go back to sleep. So having the phone uh, near you uh, is very detrimental. So I cannot uh, stress that factor. So the next thing is why are you waking up in the middle of the night? One of the most commonest things people wake up in the middle of the night is sleep apnea. So whenever you have an apnea, the brain wakes you up because the, the aim of your brain is to keep you alive. And then you wake up. So if you're snoring, you have to rule that out uh, that may be one of the significant reasons why you're waking up in the middle of the night. And then the next thing is, are you high in men, especially uh, if you have a prostate problem, they wake up. So again, it goes to medical problem, I mean, medical reason. And, exp and also women who are, uh, you have a perimenopausal or postmenopausal, they have night sweats. That wakes them up and also the lining of the uh, you know the uh, urine passage gets slowed uh, during perimenopause and menopause and women are at, at risk for urinary tract infection that could be waking them up uh, or there may be many habits of, of uh, uh, people uh, drinking their favorite tea uh, towards uh, bedtime or even alcohol uh, bed close to bedtime that can all wake up so we have to go through some of their habits what's the what's happening so mm -hmm. then if we it's a stress and anxiety is a problem then you have to focus on that if medical mm -hmm. problems uh, you have to uh, wake up but uh, the most important thing when you wake up in the middle of the night is sleep apnea wakes you up yeah. so that's a easily treatable condition so if you screen a hundred people I'm talking about adults who wake up in the middle of the night more than 60 or 70 percent will have sleep apnea mm. thank you for that reminder that often the sleep challenges that one may face is a, a symptom of an underlying problem. And too often we reach to treat that symptom without adequately getting down to the root cause. And that's a great reminder because like many things in healthcare, if you treat the symptom and miss the root, the treatment is minimally effective and it never really gives you the release and the, the healing that you may need. Right. Um, we heal in our sleep. Yeah. And I reiterate this point many times. Lack of sleep is an underlying. There's something beneath the surface, especially in children. I have mentioned this many times in my book. Children are sound sleepers as parents and uh, grandparents and, and the viewers you are, you are listening. If your child, meaning a pre-college age, uh, pre age child, is not sleeping, it's actually a cry for help. 
we have to pay attention to the child why the child is not sleeping as we know as we grow older you know in college your sleep is bad then we have our jobs you have your family you have your all the other commitments uh, so but children should be sound sleeper if the child is not sleeping it is a cry for help the mm -hmm. child needs help so please pay attention to that yeah. uh, so sleep uh, you know uh, lack thereof is a t is a warning symptom for something underneath mm -hmm. thank you and you touched on, and we'll go back to sleep apnea. Yes. Um, I don't ever want to overstate something, but I think even as much awareness as they is, there is now around sleep apnea, it's still underdiagnosed and underappreciated and really underrespected. Um, I run into many individuals where we talk about their sleep, their health, maybe their weight. Maybe we talk about snoring, maybe we don't, but we, we feel like we get on the scent of sleep apnea but there's still a lot of reluctance. Yes. Um, what do you tell the people or what would you recommend I tell the patients that maybe tell me, well, I don't have time for a sleep study or I could never sleep in a mask with a machine. And they have that immediate block before they even pursue diagnosis or treatment. So those are, you know, things have evolved in the last 40 years, uh, ever since sleep apnea concept has been uh, aware, people are aware of. See, the treatment is uh, simpler. The diagnosis is even more simpler. In the past, we had to go to the lab study. Now we have something called home sleep studies. I, I, I do always uh, home sleep studies unless there are a few circumstances when I send them for in-lab, but 90% or 95%, I only order home sleep studies. So you just take this device from my office, you sleep with it and then return it back the next day. So that's easy. Mm -hmm. uh, people are afraid naturally. They don't want to be in a strange environment, uh, you know, like a hotel room, being people watched on, ca and, uh, watched on camera. In fact, everybody sleeps better in their own house and you get a better data mm -hmm. and better information. And of course, the treatment is just not the mask anymore. The masks, in fact, are smaller. Then there are newer uh, devices called like Excite OSA. Then there's Inspire. Then there's Oral Appliance. Uh, so there's many, many uh, new treatments that are available. So the, the most important things, if you're snoring, uh, there is almost like a 90% chance that you have sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you, know, you know, as we grow older, you know, lack of hormones, uh, you know, low testosterone, low, test uh, low estrogen in women uh, can, can cause sleep apnea. In fact, you know, I have sleep apnea. I'm, you know, I did my home sleep study and then, you know, I'm on this uh, newer treatment device. So we are all prone as we age, things sag and, you know, blocks the airway and that causes the obstruction, that causes the snoring and couples are sleeping separately. I, the new terminology is called sleep divorce. Uh, you know, that affects their marriages. My aim is to bring couples together. Uh, so because of the snoring, the, you know, the, the couples are sleeping separately. So it, it affects uh, different, uh, you know, uh, different parts of our body, emotionally, psychological, not to mention the health concerns and the, the benefits of uh, treating sleep apnea. Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I always feel in primary care, I've always said throughout my career that there's very few conditions that a primary care doc can diagnose and manage that, that the patient considers life changing. But sleep apnea, I remember some of the first individuals I saw when I started my career 10, 11 years ago, that when you change someone's sleep, and like you touched on, you may change their relationship with their partner. Um, you change their energy during your, the day, you change their focus. Those are the type of things patients give you hugs about. Correct. You know, they're so thankful and it originated with a sleep disorder and sleep apnea being so common is one that you often can see. You mentioned Inspire, Excite OSA and some of the, the non CPAP technologies, um, Tell me more about how you select which patients for which intervention. Great question. You know, sleep apnea is, uh, you know, depends upon the number of events of apnea per hour is classified into mild, medium, and severe. So CPAP uh, is generally reserved for uh, severe. That's the best treatment. When it is mild to moderate, you have the newer treatments, uh, the Excite 
OSA. That's like a tongue uh, exercising device. Uh, it strengthens the muscles of the tongue. And the next is the oral appliance when done right by an expert uh, dentist actually moves the jaw a little bit forward and gets the tongue. Remember, the, the tongue is the major problem that causes the obstruction. We talk about sleep apnea, but there's a word before it. It's called obstructive sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. The tongue causes almost 90% of the reason for the obstruction and all the treatment, in including CPAP, uh, you know, blows air to get the tongue out of the way. So there's mm -hmm. newer options. And of course, uh, if it is mild, a 10% weight loss will also help with the resolution of their apnea. So weight loss and the newer treatments, uh, you know, uh, can help uh, people w in their journey. You know, treatment of sleep apnea actually adds years to your life because you're preventing all the other uh, medical complications uh, that can be easily controlled with the treatment of sleep apnea. Mm -hmm. You actually touched there on something I also wanted to go back to where you reference, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but you reference how maybe suboptimal hormones can lead to sleep disorders, maybe even sleep apnea. But then the presence of that then magnifies the deficiency of those hormones. And even I think we could probably draw a correlation there to the weight where individuals who are overweight or obese are more likely to have sleep disorders and then having that sleep disorder makes it harder to lose weight. Correct. And oftentimes I'll use a, a, a metaphor of a hamster wheel of mm -hmm. despair, mm -hmm. where once that poor little hamster gets on that wheel and keeps running, it, it doesn't realize how fast it's running and getting nowhere. And tell me a little bit about your thoughts on that process, where you really have an interplay between maybe a low hormone or an, an individual with more body weight than they need, and then the sleep disorder. Where do you intervene, or do you have to intervene at multiple spots in that loop? Great, great question. So, see, when we make our new resolution about fitness and weight, we got to have this third dimension, that is uh, sleep. When you sleep well, you have more energy uh, to work out, and that also changes the metabolism. It actually alters the leptin and the ghrelin. So mm -hmm. as, as everybody's aware, leptin lowers our appetite, ghrelin increases our appetite. Poor sleep changes the uh, ratio, so we end up with more ghrelin and the more appetite. So, so we have to have good sleep as a found in fact it is a foundation on where fitness and weight loss is built and as you gain weight uh, you've fallen into this uh, vicious cycle or the hamster wheel where you know you, the more weight causes you to have more obstruction in your throat because fat is uh, deposited evenly all through uh, our body. So it narrows, we are talking about millimeters. So when it narrows, uh, you have more sleep apnea and then more, you know, with sleep apnea, your metabolism is lower than more weight gain. So somewhere along the line, we have to break that uh, mm -hmm. cycle. Mm -hmm. And the hormones, uh, you know, the low testosterone and estrogen, you know, can cause uh, sleep apnea. And also the replacement has to be done by an expert because too much of these hormones can change the deposition and the mobilization of fat. And that can, in fact, can lead to sleep apnea. So it has to be done by an expert even when hormone replacement uh, therapy is being done. So mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, well, and I know to a, to a patient, it can seem overwhelming that you know, they, especially if they're late to the diagnosis or even late to seek treatment where they're, they may be feeling so many symptoms, like we said initially, that, that come back to the root cause of maybe poor sleep or poor lifestyle habits. Um, but I always try to simplify things with my patients where they don't feel the overwhelm that we prioritize. You know, what should we touch first, second, and third? And what's a reasonable amount of time to see positive change? and try to consolidate the noise and the overwhelm into an actionable list. So thank you for, for bringing that to our attention as well with some of, even going back to your acronym, um, I, I wanted to touch on some of the evening habits and how evening habits, even healthy habits yes. may negatively impact sleep. So I'd love for you, if you can, to touch on um, nutrition uh, when we should eat compared to our sleep time. Needless to say, we work with a lot of individuals who are very busy. They don't have traditional work hours. Um, they have families that are involved in many things. And so they're, maybe their dinner time isn't quite as predictable as they would like. So touching on how, when, and maybe even what you eat at night can affect your sleep. And then alcohol and 
an evening drink or two? How does that affect one's sleep patterns? All right. So even just having a high glycemic meal with high carbs four hours prior to going to sleep can affect your quality of sleep. Mm. So, uh, and also a large meal. Uh, you, the body is trying to digest that meal and the end product of that digestive process is heat. Remember when I talked about mm. heat is, uh, it does not help secretion of melatonin. So that's the reason why after a big meal, people not sleep well. And not only that, the big meal distends your stomach. You know, the food stays in our stomach, the digestive process, about two to three hours. So ideally, I'll, I'll, if you're going to have a meal, make sure at least uh, three hours prior to going to sleep. And try to eat a smaller meal at bedtime. And also, the full stomach can provoke acid reflux. And the, in fact, the, national, uh, the, na the natural biorhythm of the body, the peak acid is secreted between 2 and 4 a.m. So now, you have a spicy or high uh, you know carbonated drinks then that causes more reflux and then the more acid and the acid can literally come up to the back of your throat and I have that's another reason people wake up in the middle of the night with uh, uh, you know coughing spells because the acid is irritating the throat so those are some of those things so eat, uh, eat a, a smaller meal at least uh, uh, and preferably with uh, salad and less uh, carbs uh, uh, at least three to four hours prior to going to sleep. So we'll have mm -hmm. our body to have a nice digestive system and the and the food has left the stomach. As regarding alcohol, it's very, very uh, interesting. Uh, alcohol, some people drink alcohol to go to sleep, which is absolutely the wrong thing to do uh, because uh, alcohol does not put you to sleep. It actually acts like an anesthetic. It drowns the brain, but it's not good quality sleep. Mm -hmm. And then alcohol metabolizes into acetaldehyde, which is a chemical irritant wakes you up and also alcohol is a diuretic and then you have to wake up uh, to uh, to use the restroom so uh, having a glass or two of wine maybe around six or seven that's fine but using it as an hypnotic or a medicine to go to sleep is absolutely a wrong thing to do mm -hmm. uh, because of the many reasons uh, the more acetaldehyde that builds up in your body the more it's going to wake you up so uh, prevent it uh, you know uh, drinking closer to bedtime because it's going to happen three to four hours with the mm -hmm. buildup of uh, this chemical. Yeah, so so it sounds like really a four-hour window there, yes. um, which I think you also rec um, recognize for exercise. Correct. So don't exercise within four hours of bedtime. Yes. Don't take in any calorie or drink other than water. Yes. Um, ideally, within four hours of bedtime. Yes. Great, great. That's That gives discipline and structure exactly. that I know goes back, obviously, to to uh, many pieces of your acronym, but I love when I can recommend really easy, the easy button, so to speak, where somebody just has to look at a, a watch and say, well, can I, or can't I, Yes. they don't, they don't have to worry about anything else other than no bedtime's at 10. And so at 6 PM, no more exercise, no more nutrition or yes. calorie. Um, so I love that guidance and that structure. Last thing I really want to touch on, um, and I deliberately wanted, and I'm glad our conversation allowed this to be at the end, is sleep medications. I think you and I probably agree that medications are, you know, often very appropriate and necessary even, but, but you really can't overlook the focus on these foundations and doing the right thing to set you up for success. But let's talk a bit about sleep medications. As you can imagine, many people come to me and they've already reached for something. Um, if they're having trouble maybe falling asleep or even staying asleep, they'll have tried melatonin. They may have reached for Unisom or other over-the-counter agents. What's your approach to a discussion when a patient um, desires sleep medications? Correct. So in my practice, I've always done it the holistic way. So my aim is to take people off all the medications. There is mm -hmm. no safe uh, medication, sleep medication out there. Uh, the over-the-counter medications, uh, they work for a little bit, but they don't because we have our own melatonin. We have our own GABA, which is another chemical that puts us to sleep. So I am uh, not a huge fan of medications, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes I am I have to. Uh, you know, in ten percent of my patients, I do uh, have to put them on medications. But uh, you know, uh, even. You know, any long-term medications has side effects, uh, can have uh, memory issues. Mm -hmm. And the most important is 
feeling tired the next day you are in a brain fog and then you also have the risk of falling you know that's another risk of this uh, resid residual side effects of the medication so even if i prescribe any medication i reassess them consistently about three every three to six months trying an effort to lower the medications or wean them off the medications. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, new medications which are giving some hope, uh, but uh, everything comes, uh, it's a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, it helps two people to sleep, but then you have the side effects the next day being groggy and also yes. the memory problems that have been associated with long-term use of uh, medications. Yes, and, and many of which can build dependence or tolerance in their use, and so, you become, that becomes part of your sleep routine. And like you mentioned, and I love your goal of getting individuals off sleep medications. Do you, do you have any tips or, or recommendations for patients who may come to you or to myself having been on a, a medication like an Ambien or even a terazidone or even a melatonin for let's say a couple of years. So they have, they have well, um, they have adjusted their life to include the medication. Do you have a different approach to them or recommendations for, for tapering a med? So the best way, way is to lower the dose. If they're on 10 milligrams, I tell them to go by to 50, I'm mean, sorry, to five milligrams. And then also taking the medication every other day, right? So you, you can go off these medications dramatically. You have to go you know, if they're taking 10, go to 5, and then 2.5, slowly wean them off. And try to look into the other things that could be causing the sleep problem. So if they started this medication a few years ago, they may have gained weight. Uh, you know, they might have, you know, even other conditions like restless leg syndrome, which is mm -hmm. easily treated with iron. So other disorders or heart problem, lung problem could have creeped in over these mm -hmm. years. So adjust, you know, addressing that and trying to wean them uh, off. So if at all you have to put somebody or if they have to keep on the medication, the lowest is probably the best. And using the, the, the acronym and trying to have a discipline mm -hmm will you know get the power back we have it within ourselves we don't need an external medication uh you know for us um so empower people and yeah. if, if they need the lowest possible medication so to answer your question tell them to go at a lower dose that's what i do in my own practice and then try every other day and empower them mm. rule out sleep disorders medical disorders and if they have anxiety which is causing them address that uh, you know and then they won't need any medications. I've been quite successful in taking several patients of medication uh, in the last, uh, in the, in the, over the 20 years I've been in practice. That's great. Yes. Well, and I, when you use the word empower, it brings back to memory the superpower yes. that you touched on yeah. at the beginning. And I think to even view what can be so frustrating for patients, a lack of sleep or a fatigue that's affected by sleep, to reframe their awareness that it is actually a superpower that just has to be cultivated, has to be trained, and can end up being such a positive influence on their health journey. So, so when yeah. people say they're compromising on their sleep to do that extra work, I tell you, if you sleep that extra hour, you will be more productive the next day. Trust me, you know, because our mind is uh, and our brains are like supercharged computer. It needs a break. Uh, you know, uh, we live in this hustle culture with so much information, overdrive, but you, we need more rest. And, so uh, you know, you can refuel, re-energize your brain and your thinking capacity because we heal in our sleep, we grow in our uh, sleep, uh, you know, memory consolidation, learning all happens in our sleep. You know, I've discovered this joy despite all my struggles and I put it into writing and, uh, you know, I want that joy to be uh, heard and felt with everybody else. No, that's so true. I often look back and think of my medical school training where I had no frame of reference at the time, but I can almost guarantee I would have been a better student if I had studied less yes. and slept more. Correct. Um, all too often, whether you're in school or a professional, we, we infringe upon our sleep to our own detriment um, for all those reasons you just mentioned. So it's a great reminder of, of, you know, maybe an extra hour of sleep may gain you three hours of productivity the next day, Correct. Um, which is powerful. So... Well, Dr. John, we are so blessed to have you on this spotlight edition of our Future Medicine podcast, but I really want to tell our listenership how they can connect with you, 
Um, obviously, our practice located here in Nashville, and you practice just a little bit south in Brentwood. Tell us about your sleep clinics, but then also tell us about the release of your book that came out um, earlier this month in April of 2024. Tell us about your book and where it can be purchased, as well as tell us about the Sleep Fix Academy that allows you to reach individuals outside the local Nashville area and can reach, obviously, the, the ends of the country and the globe. So, well, uh, you know, you know I think how excited I'm about sharing about my book. It's come out, it's called uh, Nobody's Sleeping, The Seven Pool and Sleep Strategies. Uh, that's my work for 25 years to uh, to empower people so that they can be more knowledgeable. It's available on Amazon and every major retailer, bookstores available on Barnes and Noble, uh, you know, wherever uh, you guys shop, it's there. So that's, um, you know, hopefully people can learn more about that. So my clinic is uh, located in Brentwood uh, and it's called Sleep Wellness Clinics of America. And also the online academy is uh, called uh, Sleep Fix Academy. I'm on all the social media handles. In, in fact, I'm also on TikTok. I've taken the name of Dr. Sleep Fix. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, so I kept the same thing with Sleep Fix Academy. I also have a Sleep Now course. People who don't want to see uh, uh, you know, positions or they want to see me at the time, they can take that online course. Uh, uh, it's a six-week uh, you know, interactive course. Uh, I put it on my website. So people can also do that uh, if they need to. So I have all the resources. I have also a lot of blogs. I have a sleep assessment on my website. Uh, I have a podcast um, and a lot of resources uh, on my website, sleepfixacademy.com. That's great. Well, I want to make sure that our listenership knows that as much information as there is out there, as much as there is to consume, that any amount of content that can be consumed from you is valuable. Um I haven't completely read your book yet, as I told you, but I will tell you from what I know about you and from the chapters I've read, the sections I've read, there's such depth. I told you before we started, every word is meaningful. So, um, so much value that you give through this book. And I can only imagine the Sleep Fix Academy gives so much value through the course and other resources that you can connect people with. So, um, once again, Dr. John, thank you for coming on to our podcast. Um, really want to encourage any listeners local or, or broader to reach out to you and to connect with your, your content and have their lives truly changed. Sleep is so important. I'm so glad we share that. You have been a great colleague of mine to co-manage many patients with sleep disorders and I'm thankful for you taking the time to be here. Thanks, Greg. It was my pleasure. You know, the world needs to heal. We need to uh, sleep better. We can be better human beings just by sleeping. The simple thing that we have we all need to seek outside within us. You know, it's a superpower, like mentioned. So when you sleep well, you're going to be a great person. You know, uh, your, your personal life, your family life, your professional life, your athletic life. So I have many chapters in my book. Uh, my aim is to spread this uh, message all over the world. Uh, please uh, support me in this and uh, sleep well and be well, everyone. Absolutely. Blessings on those efforts. Thank you. Thank you.